praise God. Don't we just love Pastor Frank? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. <laughs> praise God. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you with our hearts and our minds, Father, open to receive from the word. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that is our leader, our guide, our teacher, and that he reveals all things to us. I thank you, Father, tonight that he is here and he is doing what he does best, which is to open each heart and each mind and drop into pieces and nuggets of things that every, that's necessary for each person. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You know, the Bible is not that hard to understand. How many of you figured that out yet? It's not that hard. I haven't, I've heard people say, you know, just don't understand the Bible. Well, they don't understand the Bible if there's a reason you don't understand the Bible. And the first reason is because you've got to get born again. <laughs> you have to be saved to understand some of the things in the Word of God. You know, what God's going to show you as, if you're not saved is, uh, uh, you know, direction to get saved. And so uh, that can be a reason why people don't understand the Bible is because they're not born again. Another reason why they don't understand the Bible is because they don't want to change. The Bible is very clear on many things in the Word of God, what it wants you to do, what's going on. And uh, if you don't want to change, you say, well, I just don't understand that. I thought Pastor mentioned that this morning uh, about somebody that had come in about a scripture. So it kind of fit where I was going. About a scripture, they said, well, I just don't believe that. Well, whether you believe it or not, it's, it's right there and it's real clear that you have to forgive because that's what it says, your prayers are going to be hindered. So if you don't understand it, it's because you've chosen not to. Now, this is for a believer. You've chosen not to understand it because it requires something from you. It requires change. Then other reasons is because they have their own understanding. How many times have we seen in the scriptures where the Bible says, have your own, don't have your own understanding in the things? If you're going to God with questions, if you're going to God with the, uh, the open, uh, opening the word and asking him questions about the word, then you've got to just dismiss what your, your previous thoughts are, are. And if you've been raised in a traditional church and some of these things will be new, like the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, maybe even divine, divine healing by speaking the word, those things might be new to you. You'll have to dismiss anything negative that you heard from previous denominations because not everybody's walking in that light. But, you know, God leads us out one at a time to walk in the light. So tonight, I want to talk to you about, oh, I know what I want to say, the, that sometimes Christians don't like to hear these words, and especially young people. Holy living. <laughs> holy living. Godly living. They're, they're like curse words to them. And many times Christians don't like to hear those terms. It makes them run almost in terror. And many times they leave the church and don't want to come back. And not just, not just young people, but people in general. They want God to do all the work, and they don't want to do anything. Now, you know he's already completed the work. Yeah. Jesus already completed the work. But once you accept Jesus, then we have a work to do. Yeah. And we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, that means, doesn't mean we're going to look just like him. You're, when you come to Jesus, you look like this, you're still going to look like this. But it means that on the inside, something takes place. And the Spirit of God moves in, recreates our spirit, and makes us brand new so that we can now follow the example of Jesus Christ. Many times we'll take and we'll try to follow people and what they're doing and what they say about the word, but the Bible's real clear. And turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. Hallelujah. I'm giving it to him now. I forgot, but I did tell him it's the NIV. Every scripture's NIV, which you know that's not my norm. So I'm trying to conform. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Again, the scripture tells us we're not to follow man. Although Paul did say that, he says, follow me, but he says, as I follow Christ. Well, that's fine, except for you can follow Christ all by yourself. We have the holy word of God, and we should be listening to what Jesus says and what Jesus does. Amen? So he says, 
For this you were called. We have been called to be followers. We have been called to uh, be an example, Christ's example in this world. Amen? Hallelujah. So many Christians that are walking around doing things their own way all the time, and I can say that I've been guilty at different times of doing my own thing. Has, has anybody else, just me, been doing my own thing and not really consulting or, or talking to God about it if it's even what he wants me to do? It just seems right, and sometimes those things are they're okay. But they're not always, I want to go for the best. How about you? Now, in verse 22, so we're called to follow Christ's example. That's the example. Praise God for the example of Christ, that I don't have to be caught up and look at anybody else, and that way it'll keep you out of judging. Right. Because you'll be looking at them and say, oh, but they, they did that, they slipped there. But if we always follow what the Word says and follow Christ, we will not get upset. We will not be in a position of judging anyone. We will stay with the scripture. So in verse 22, it says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he had no threats. When, when he suffered, he had no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself who judges justly. He trusted himself who judges just, justly. If we're going to be Christ's example, we are going to have to not get upset at insults. Now, I can speak out of this. <laughs> I've had plenty. And so I know that I'm not alone, that if I've had to deal with people not saying nice things, that I know every single person in here has had that. So we have to entrust ourselves. We have to trust ourselves that God is going to judge things justly. Yes. Amen? Amen. And so we've been called to, be, to follow him and do it the way he's done it. That's what 1 Peter 2.21 says. And then it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. So he says, we, you say, well, you know, Jesus didn't sin. And he didn't. He had no sin. No sin was found in him. Pastor told us this morning, we do sin. The Bible says if you say you have sin... Uh, if you say you haven't sinned, then you lie. And so we have sinned. But we can follow the Christ example, and we can always stay over in that place. Because it says, if you have sinned, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and cleanse you from that unrighteous act. And so therefore, you'd be put right back in that right standing with God. Pick up where you left off and go on. Aren't you glad you have Jesus? Praise God. I like the word. <laughs> This letter was written to the church. This epistle was written to the church. They were not following after Christ, even though they were saved and they were in the church. They were doing their own thing. They were getting involved in some a lot of worldly things. So he was reminding the people of God who, what Christ had done for them. And so tonight, I just want to remind you, just in case you get tempted to do, get into the worldly things, and there's plenty out there. Oh, my, there's even more than I can remember before. There's a lot of worldly things that you can get involved in. So whose example are we to follow? Christ's example. In Acts 10, 38, now we're still following Christ. In Acts 10, 38, it says, uh, Acts 10, 38, <laughs> sorry, I didn't get it. I forgot that one part. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went, about, went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with them. We are anointed with the same Holy Spirit and the same power. Amen. One thing that Jesus did, that why we don't walk around feeling like we're anointed or acting like we are anointed, anointed, is because we don't stay over in the anointing. Because we get involved and get tangled up in the things of this life. I figured out a long time ago, you can do both. Or God would not be a just God if he only had certain people that could do it. You know, like people that, you know, are in the ministry and they don't have a job and they don't have to do this. Let me tell you what. <laughs> just because I don't get up at 9 and have a 9 to 5 or 8 to 4.30 job, I, working with people is a job. And you get all kinds of things that can go around. It, whatever they deal with, it comes to you. And it talks to you. 
I've been very familiar with people that have been dealing with all kinds of things that I have to leave after counseling them and get that off because it will talk to you. The same thing will talk to you. So it's still work, <laughs> amen? It's still work to stay anointed. We need to stay in that anointing, and we are to follow Christ's example. He never left that anointing. Hallelujah. He counted it as precious. You know, he counted it as, as uh, uh, priceless. It was the most precious thing he had because his mind was always on people. His mind was always on helping. His mind was always on giving. His mind was always on serving. And if we're to follow his example, I don't know about you, but I had to pick some things back up. I had to follow his example of serving, having my mind set on these things instead of my mind on many, many other things. How many of you are hearing me? Hallelujah. I know I'm not alone in this house tonight. Hallelujah. Jesus went about doing good. He went about healing the oppressed. He went about, because people were full of fear, and he, he spoke to their fear. People have emotional pain. They have physical pain. All kinds of things. So we need to be about the example of Jesus. You say, well, you know, I, I had a hard week. I had a hard week. You know, this went on and that went on and this happened and that happened. I've got the same hard week that you all had. And so the Lord was telling me, if you will get back where I told you to be, he said, that hard week won't look so hard. It'll, it may not even change at all, but it won't look so hard because I'll be looking through the anointing. I'll be looking through the grace of God. I'll be looking with different glasses. I'll be looking through the word. I'll be looking through the example of Jesus did whenever he ran into problems, storms and such. You know, whenever he ran into uh, different things. So we can do it. Say, I can do it. In verse 39 of Acts 10, 38, it says, We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross. The disciples say they were witnesses to all these great things that Jesus did to the Jews and to Jerusalem. And then in verse 42, he says, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is one of whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Dead. So the disciples of that day said, we have seen him do all this stuff. We've witnessed these things. That's what they were saying. We witnessed these things. And he told us, and then he actually, the word says, he commanded us. Amen. It was a command to preach. What does preach mean? Proclaim to the people. Tell people about God and tell people about the wonderful things that he's, he does. Through the word, but through your own personal life. Tell them. Everyone has a story that hasn't ended yet. You're still here. So your story is still going on. Hallelujah. After you receive Christ and you have your eyes open to the scriptures, you are to say what you can say that you are witnesses to. In, um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Follow Christ's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Are you his dearly loved child? That he says, follow him. Follow his example. Not just follow him. See, some people say, I'm follower of Christ. But follow his example of life. Follow his example of living. Follow what he says. And that's what the Bible says. That's how you become a disciple. Aren't we all disciples of Christ? Yeah. We're supposed to be. We may not be there yet, but we are supposed to be. And then it says in verse 2, And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I want to give you an example in, in Mark 5. Hallelujah. Mark 5, and starting in verse 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. They went across the lake to the region of Garcinius. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been chained in hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, and he would cry out and cut himself with stones. 
When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell at his knees in front of him. He shouted at the vo- top of his voice, "What do I want? What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of Most? What do you want with me, Jesus, Most Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me, Jesus. For Jesus had said to him, "Come out of this man, you impure spirit." Then Jesus asked him, "What is your name?" Now, mind you, he's talking to the spirits. It says, Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. In verse 11, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep banks into the lake, and they were drowned. When when I was attending Ramah, one afternoon I was meditating on that very scripture and was reading that. And just happened after I was done reading it, I laid down, and I was just kind of in a meditated, uh, meditated state. And I was thinking about that man that lived in the tombs, what he had gone through, what was going on in his life, what caused him to go there. And then all of a sudden, I saw this man chained up with chains. Now, I've never been bound with physical chains, but I have definitely had mental chains that had me bound. So strong, I couldn't breathe. So long, I didn't want to live. Was afraid to live and afraid to die. And they just had me enwrapped. And they were there for a long time. I was at Ramah and still had those chains. Because it took a lot of the word of God to be able to, un- to, to loose those things. A lot of meditation on what God, the word said, and what God, how he felt about me to loose me from those things. So I was meditating on it. And I saw this man chained. I saw Jesus walk up. I saw the demons tremble. And I saw the demon, uh, Jesus, talk to the man that was oppressed with them. Then I heard Jesus' voice. Now, I'm saying, I'm not reading this. I had already read it, and I could feel it. I felt the very presence of that mountainside where he was standing in that, in that thing. I heard Jesus' voice call out to those demons, Come out of him! Come out of him! And they did. And they went into the pigs. I heard the pigs running. Uh, they said there was 2,000 demons. I heard them stomping down the sides of that and dust and everything just kind of blown around. I heard those demons scream. When they leave a man, they scream. And so it was screaming, and they were going down, running down that hill, and they went into the pigs, and they splashed into the water, and they were drowned. So I could say, I witnessed that. Was I there 2,000 years ago? No, but I witnessed that. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to make us witnesses to what he has done before and now. It's not just what happens to us now, but if we'll get in the word, we'll make the word so real, so alive, you'll think you were there. I thought I was there. I did not know I was laying on my couch meditating until somebody come up and touched me and just startled me right out of where I was. And I was glad because I was in it. You know, how, you know what I mean by I was in it? I mean, I was there. To see Christ as your example, you need much time in meditation and in prayer. If you're meditating on those things, you're not going to have a whole lot of time for other things. Meditating on. And God says this. He says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, fixed, right there. On him, is what he says. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to hear, I'm going to be, my mind's going to be on Jesus on Sunday, but on Monday and Tuesday, I'm I'm in another world. I'm going to do something different. He says, it stayed on him. Keep it there all the time. Hallelujah. Christ is our example. Not man. Not what man does. Christ is our example. The only way you're going to know about him is get in there and stay in there. Get in there and stay in there. Hallelujah. So you see, with him being our example, then we need to see what he did. How many of you know he had much time in prayer? In Luke 6, 
in chap, uh, chapter 6, in verse 12. It says, one, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. I'm, not, I'm taking them out of context because I just want to show you how many times, some of the times that he just, that's what he did. He went out and we prayed. We're talking about his example, being like him, walking and being like Christ. You're going to have to be a whole big prayer. Do you want to see people delivered? Do you want to see them you know, free from torments in their minds? Jesus couldn't do that by being Jesus without the anointing. And the anointing was, uh, didn't come unless he spent time with the anointed one, which was God. You can't, they, don't, they go together. You can't have one without the other. And so then in, in Matthew 6 and verse 12 says, one, one of the days Jesus went out into the mountainside to pray, and he spent one time he spent the whole night praying to God. In Matthew 14, 22 through 24, it says, Immediately Jesus uh, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside again by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was, ready, was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the winds and because, because, the, uh, because the winds were against it, which I'm not going into the story of that. Most of you know that, but that would be a good meditating story of being tossed in the boat. In Mark 1, verse 35 says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went out to a solitary place where he prayed. We're talking about Christ's example. Now, he knows that you have a job. He knows that you have children. He knows all of those things, but yet he still feels that we can do this because he said we're to follow him. We're to be, uh, use him as, a, as our example. Amen. Pastor made mention to me when somebody had said something. He, I said, yeah, I feel for him. And then he says, I don't know why you do. He said, you were going to Ramah. You were, you were going to school. You had a job, and you were raising two kids. And I spent a lot of time with God. And I don't mean just my Ramah time that I had four hours a day. I mean at 5 o'clock in the morning time with God. I, that's what I did. Now, in my case, it was necessary but on the same hand, I wouldn't have had it any other way because I enjoyed being in his presence. I enjoyed what I had. I enjoyed that, that fellowship and that relationship with I, that I had with him. It was more important to, than anything else. Did the other things mean, weren't, didn't mean much to me? They meant where they needed to be. God first. Amen. And Jesus was the same way. He said, I don't do anything I don't see my father do. Wow. I thought, well, I got some growing to do. So I do a lot of things that I didn't see God do. <laughs> some of my own inventions. How many of you got some of your own inventions that you do? Amen. Hallelujah. I like that. Very early in the morning, I said, yeah, I remember when I used to do that, God. Are we going back there? <laughs> Are we going to very early? You mean six comes twice on the clock, you know? <laughs> I, I got to be a late night person. I used to be an earlier person. Now I'm a late night because I, especially with summer coming, you know, it gets dark later. I love that. And then after everybody goes to bed, then I like to go to bed. You know, I mean the world. <laughs> when the world goes to bed, that's when it gets quiet. And then I fall asleep. Amen. Amen. Praise God. In Mark um, six forty six again, he says, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Christ is our example. He is our example for living. And, you know, praise God for people that walk as Christ-like as they can. But, I mean, I got to tell you, mostly we fall short. Even the best of them fall short. So if you don't want to fall short, just follow Christ. Follow the, what he says. Read about him. See what he, see what he has said in his word to the, to the church. And that's what Peter was doing. He came to the church. He said, I'm going to have to remind these guys again what Jesus has done. But for him to say that by his stripes and then they, they were here, he bore your sickness and disease, I thought, well, they must have been sick again. Yeah. Sickness had come into the church. Well, we have to be reminded that Jesus did carry that. Yeah. Now, don't get all in a tizzy if you've gotten some, you know, 
uh, symptoms on you and you had to do some, uh, some fighting, that's what it's about. That's what faith is for. You don't have to use faith unless you're in a battle. And that's why he gave it to us. So we just use it. Praise God. Christ is our example. Let's go back to 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled the insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on his body on the cross so that we be, might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you now have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. That's exactly what happened. He was at the church. Peter was at the church, and he was reminding them, you've been astray. You've been running wild. You've been going off in your own direction. You've been doing your own thing. Whether they were bad things or not really wasn't the issue. It was just you were doing your own thing. You had forgotten that Christ is the one you should be following. You forgot that he is the one that carried, he committed no sin. You forgot that he carried all this for, for you. You forgot. Now I want to read the rest of this out of my Bible. I'm going to try. It's not big. It's not big print. And we'll see how this works. Praise God. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Pastor alluded to some of this this morning, so I won't, I'm not going to dwell there, which wasn't the main point anyhow. And verse 1 says, In the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by your behavior, by the behavior of their wives. So you can see right there, if we're following Christ, that's an important factor. Just, just in marriage, it's an important factor. And uh, as a matter of fact, that was one thing that helped Pastor come around was because I, I got so involved with Jesus and he had totally t turned my life around that I just walked with him. I just, I wouldn't do anything that was, was like I would have responded before. And I responded totally different like that. It was a change. It was a radical change. And so uh, not everybody, it doesn't happen that way, but for whatever reasons, that's what God did when we, a lady had prophesied over us. She said, God did a quick work. He did a quick work because we were dragging our feet in the world. And so he did a quick work to get us where we needed to be, which was here. And so here we is, praise God. And you're just so happy about it, right? Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so um, that change, when you, when you act like Christ, what are they going to do? It's kind of like when somebody says to me, gives me a God said about something. I say, well, what can I say? If you say God said it, then who am I to say anything? So when you're acting like God, what's, what was he going to say? You just, you shut up because you can't, you can't refute that. You're being just like Jesus. As they served, you uh, serve your chase, observe your chase and respectful behavior. Your adornment must be not merely external, braided hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, or let it be the hidden man person of the heart. So it's not like you do have to still be dressed, and there's nothing wrong with painting the barn when it looks, you know, needs paint. <laughs> I mean, that is good, you know, it is good. However... <laughs> That's not supposed to be the focus or the main thing. It's supposed to be what's going on on the inside of you. Is the Holy Spirit working in you, the fruit of the Spirit, and all those changes that need to take place. Amen? But, so, but still get dressed and look good. Hallelujah. <laughs> the world needs us to look good. <laughs> okay. Praise God. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imper imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which, which is precious in the sight of God. And so he goes on to tell about 
the men, you know, the husbands, what they should do. But here's what I, I'm just going to go with this. After he's done explaining all of that, he goes to verse 8 and he says, to sum it up, don't you like that? <laughs> Get to the point. To sum it up, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. I started this with following Christ, be, having Christ's example, and it started with in verse 21, for you have been called for this purpose. You have been called for the purpose of being a blessing to the world. I remember when I was at Raymond, they told me that I, that's what I was. I didn't like it. That it was all about the world. What about me? That's what I thought. I had to give myself. What do you mean give myself? You know, and people could do all this and do all that, and I had to still, I had to, I had to do that. So I remember sitting in the, in the class. Do you remember what class? It was Tony Cook's class. And I just thought, that just sounds funny. I thought God loved me. I was still working on God loving me. And, you know, I didn't have all that all together, and now I've got to take the little bit I got and give it away, you know. And so, uh, uh, but, but that's what we're called to do. That's what our purpose is. But if we read the whole thing, it says we are called to give a blessing instead of uh, being, having evil thoughts and doing all those things so that we might inherit a blessing. We will have Christ, who is the blessing. And everything that he is comes with him. Everything that he has comes with him. So when we have Christ, we can say we have everything. We can say we have everything. We can say you're all I need. That's what makes these songs and the things of worship so important is because when we get a re revelation of that and we realize that, that he is our blessing. Amen? Then we can be nice. We can be kind. We can be tender-hearted. We can have a gentle spirit. See, that's what it says about winning, winning your husband, who, who you'd be the closest to, is a meek and gentle spirit. That's what the world needs to see. I don't know about you, but there's been times I just want to cut them up. <laughs> little pieces, little pieces, you know. You know, praise God. I've got some, of, uh, some that are Christians that are just not, you know, they're the young, younger ones, and... And they're just not following Christ, and they're just really putting, you know, the president down and doing all this stuff. And I just, I like what they're saying now. They just said, he's president. Get over it, snowflake. <laughs> Get over it, cupcake. He's president. Just let it go and move on. Well, I kind of felt like this with this message. He's talking about godly living. He's talking about living like God. That's godly living, you know. It's living like God. And, uh, and I wanted to say to you, Get over it, snowflake. <laughs> Cupcake. Amen. Stand on your feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, God is good. I trust that you uh, gained something that you can put into your arsenal of, of knowing Jesus tonight. Amen. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for your word. Hallelujah. We'd be so lost without the word and even farther lost if we didn't have the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and our heart to it. We thank you, Father, tonight for each person that as they've come hungering and thirsting after hearing from you, Father, that you've answered and you've told them things that they needed to know tonight. I thank you for it. I give you praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We are dismissed. Come join us at New Beginnings Family Church, located in Mustang, Oklahoma, at 1615 East State Highway 152. You can find us online on Facebook and YouTube or at walkbyfaith.info. To contact us, call 405-261-6887. And remember, you don't need a second chance. You need a new beginning.